So let's be honest, this is now the Lazy Monday upload. And this week, once again, I present to you the words of wisdom of Jordan Peterson. The excerpt here comes from a much longer discussion held at Harvard University in April and covers a variety of topics, including the pronoun issue, safe spaces, gender identity, which are all worth listening to, and I encourage you to listen to the full talk, which is linked below. The section I've excerpted here is about the emptiness of activism and the alternative, which is to accept responsibility for your life and stop abdicating that responsibility by hiding behind the mask of social virtue, as Jordan Peterson puts it, and by externalizing blame onto the patriarch or some other such amorphous force. Anyway, enjoy. What is this patriarchy? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, what is it exactly? I mean, if we're going to talk about it, it's, it's, it's male domination of everything and nothing but oppression. It's like, really, that's how we're going to define our society, is it? Mm-hmm. Compared to what society, exactly? Where have people been more free than they are, for example, in this country? Now, that doesn't mean they're perfectly free, but mm-hmm. you know, forget that. That's never going to happen. It's like, well, this is an oppressive place compared to my hypo- the hypothetical utopia that I would produce if I happened to be you know, uh, Stalin for a week. Mm-hmm. And as I've, as, I've, as, I've, as I've already pointed out, if you were the, the hypothetical um, altruistic utopian of your imagination, mm-hmm. then the people right behind you in your bloody revolution would stab you to death in your bed, and you wouldn't get to make your, your decisions mm-hmm. for the benefit of anyone ever, anyways. So, so how do you think progress should be made in a world where we are freer than we have ever been? Do you think we, like when, are there changes that are desirable to be made, and how would you want to see them implemented if not through policy or through activism the way that certain groups currently are promoting? Well, back, you know, this happened in the 60s, as far as I can mm-hmm. tell, that we've got this misbegotten idea that the way to conduct yourself as a, as a responsible human being was to hold placards up to protest, to change the viewpoints of other people, and thereby usher in the utopia. Mm-hmm. It's like, I think, I think that's all appalling. I think it's appalling, and, and I think it's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely absurd that students are taught that that's the way to mm-hmm. conduct themselves in the world. First of all, if you're 19 or 20 or 21, you don't bloody well know anything. You haven't done anything. <laughs> you don't know anything about history. You haven't read anything. You haven't supported yourself for any length of time. You've been entirely dependent on your state and on your family for the, for the brief few years of your existence, and the idea that you have enough wisdom to determine how society should be reconstructed when you're sitting in the absolute lap of luxury protected by, mm-hmm. by, by processes that you don't understand is absolutely, I mean, it's... Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's a bad, let's call that a bad idea, sure. shall we? <laughs> and, then we and then the idea that what you should do to change the world is to find people who you disagree with and shake paper on sticks at them and call them names is mm-hmm. also, and, and it's a, it, and that you, you do that before you go out for, here, I'll, I'll tell you how serious the activists are. This is something that's just unbelievably comical as far as I'm concerned. So some of you may know that um, I participated in a debate on free speech, so-called debate at free speech, that the University of Toronto hosted. Um, it turned into a forum, and, and, and whatever that is, but it's certainly not a debate. But one of the things I did when I was talking to the university administration was to suggest how they might deal with the possibility of protesters. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, that's easy. I know how you can have absolutely zero protesters. Um, have it in the morning. They won't get out of bed in the tent. <laughs> Hmm. So we had it at 9 o'clock in the morning, and there was one MP, P, a me- member of parliament, who showed up to hand out some pamphlets, not a single protester. So it's like, if you want a controversial speaker on campus, just have it at 7 in the morning. You won't get a protester within 50 yards of it, because they'll still be sleeping off last night's pot and alcohol-induced hangover. <laughs> So, so, you know, and the question was, what uh-huh. do I think people should do? And yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something that's been very interesting to me, and I can see it reflected here. The first thing I've noticed is that um, when I started putting my videos on YouTube, which was about three years ago, I noticed that about 85% of the people that were watching them were men. 
-hmm. And I thought, that's pretty weird, because about 80% of my students are women, you know, mm -hmm. because men are bailing out of universities like mad, and there won't be one in the social sciences and humanities left in 10 years, but, you know, <laughs> nobody seems particularly worried about that. You can go look that up online if you want, and look at the enrollment curves, and just project them 10 years out into the future. And I've been following that for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. But one of the things, but online, it was, so it was 85% men. I thought, wow, that's really weird and strange. And then I made these political videos, and then it's popped up to 91% men. And then I've noticed in the audiences that I've gone to talk to that it's almost all men. Now just look around here, man. It's like, what, it's got to be 90% guys in this audience. And I thought, what the hell's going on? It's weird. And I noticed that at the first free speech debate at the University of Toronto. I made a point of it. I walked into the room and I thought, wow, these are all men. So I had the men stand up and the women stand up. And I used that as an example of the fact that maybe men and women have different interests. It was, you know, just an ad hoc demonstration, but it's really been borne out by the demographic analysis of my viewers. And I have, you know, about 8 million views or something like that now. So it's a pretty big population. Mm -hmm. I've been talking nonstop about personal responsibility and about the fact that if you want to change the world, you should bloody well get your act together and quit whining and sniveling about how horrible everything is and about how people owe you more rights and more privileges. And for some reason, that seems to be a message that's really resonating among young men. And I think the reason for that, first of all, I think young women have enough to do. And so that's perhaps part of the reason why the message isn't as necessary for them. They're trying to juggle career. They're trying to figure out how to have a family. And they don't really have any question about whether or not that's useful and proper. So they're off doing that and, and whatever else they're doing. But young men seem to have more of a choice about that. And many of them are essentially bailing out. And it's partly because I think they've been well punished for their virtues. And so I talk to young guys in particular about, you know, adopting some responsibility and mm -hmm. trying to straighten out their lives and to bear the load of being properly and to forthrightly move through existence and to become a credit to themselves and their community. And that's what you should do instead of waving cards at someone telling them to behave more properly because you're morally superior to mm -hmm. them. So, and for some reason that message, which is, it's a really, it's not the sort of message that you would expect to sell. Right? It's the, exactly the opposite of something that you would consider saleable. But mm -hmm. my experience has been that the young men in particular are so bloody desperate for that message that they can hardly stand themselves. And, and it's no wonder, because it's a, call to, it's a call to proper being. It's a call to heroic being. And it's a call for people to adopt their individual responsibility and to straighten themselves out and to find out what they could be like if they took on the burdens of existence like like respectable, well-educated, articulate, powerful people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's to the benefit of everyone. Yeah. And so, well, so that's where the responsibility lies. And I'm not interested in, look, I've thought for many, many years, decades really, about having a political career. I mean, I was interested mm -hmm. in a political career when I was 13. And so every five years or so, I've probably revisited that. But every time I revisited, I came to the same conclusion, which was that the, the work that I was doing that was focused on a philosophy of individual responsibility and trying to identify how that philosophy had emerged in the West over thousands of years was more important than any possible political action could be. Mm -hmm. And I still don't regard what I'm doing as political in any sense of the word. I think, it's, I think it's philosophical most accurately and there's an element of it that's theological. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I think it's individual responsibility. And the yeah. meaning of life is to be found in the adoption of individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's what the university should be teaching people. So, Dr. Peterson, you mentioned these ideas of responsibility, of virtue, of respect. You've, I think, detailed what you think students shouldn't do in these examples of like protests and these examples of certain types of activist tactics. What advice would you have for students? How can students make the changes that they want to make? Particularly, do you have any advice for students here? Yeah, read great books. Mm -hmm. Really, man. You've got this four-year period that, that has been carved out of your lives by society. They, they, it's, it's given you an identity, like a high-quality identity, and freedom at the same time. And you're not going to get that again in your life. You've got, a, you've got a respectable identity, university student, and complete freedom associated with that, or as near as you're ever going to get. And you've got these unbelievable libraries that are full of the writings of people mm -hmm. who, are, who are intelligent and articulate beyond comprehension. And, you know, and, and you can go there and you can learn all this. And you might think, well, why should you learn it? Um, well, you, you learn it to get a job, or you learn it to pe get good grades, or you learn it to get a degree. And that's all nonsense. It's nonsense. The reason that you come to university to be educated is because there is nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power. 
and I mean power of the best sort. It's authority and influence and respectability and competence. And so you come to university to craft your highest skill. And your highest skill is to be found in articulated speech. And if you're, if you're, if you're a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. And better than that, when you win everything, everyone around you wins too. Because to transform yourself into, let's consider, consider your transformation into something approximating the logos. It means you shine a light on the whole world. Well, there's nothing more exciting to do than that. There's nothing better you can possibly do. And to think that you're coming to university to be, you know, trained to have a job, it's like, great, that's a hell of a lot better than being unemployed and covered with Cheeto dust while you're <laughs> snacking away in front of your video game in the basement. But it's not, it's not a, and I don't have anything against video games, by the way. But, it, it, <laughs> but it's hardly a triumphant call to, to being in the world. And that's what university should be calling forth. It's like, God, you people, you, you know, I, I know what Harvard students are like. I taught here for five years. You people are spectacular. You're spectacular. You, you're, you're, you're all capable of being world beaters. You transform yourself into something that's articulated and sensible and grounded in history and knowledgeable and wise, man. You can do anything you want and hopefully anything you want for good. Because if you have any sense, everything you want to do would be for the good. Because there's nothing more compelling or meaningful or or useful in combating the tragedy of life than to, than to struggle with all your soul on behalf of the good. And the universities have forgotten that. It's why everyone's bailing out of the humanities. And they should. The humanities are corrupt. And they're corrupt because they're not telling students this. It's so bloody obvious. It's like, learn to think. Learn to speak. Learn to read. It makes you a superpower. An individual superpower. You have... It, it, and I don't understand why that isn't just told to students. It's not that hard to understand, and everyone wants to hear it. It's like, really, I could do that? I could do that? It's like, yeah, really, you could do that. And the whole society around you has labored for, really, thousands of years to provide every single one of you with this spectacular opportunity that you have while you're undergraduates and graduate students here. Man, they're just, everyone's just praying that you would come here and manifest everything that you could manifest. And that's what you should be doing, instead of waving placards and complaining about how you're oppressed, for God's sake. You see these Yale students complaining about their oppression. It's just, it just leaves me aghast. Mm. It's like, well, we're against the ruling class. It's like, no, 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 you're baby ruling class <laughs> members. You're young. <laughs> The only reason you're not rich is because you're young. You know, that's the best, really, that's the, if you look at the 1% even, the, the dreaded 1%, you know, most of those people are old. Why? Well, when you progress through life, if you're reasonably successful, you trade in your promising youth for your wealthy old age. But you're still bloody old. Would you, <laughs> would you trade it? Would you trade your youth for that? Like, if you factor age out of the economic equation, things look a lot different. Well, of course older people have more money. If they have any sense, they've been collecting it for their whole life. Is that somehow unfair? It's not unfair unless you want to want to be poverty-stricken when you're 70. And you, and you don't want to be poverty-stricken when you're 70. So, I just don't understand what's happened to the universities. I can't mm -hmm. believe that you're not told when you come the first day, look, man, you are on, you're here on a heroic mission. You're going to take your capacity to articulate yourself to levels that are undreamed of. You're going to come out of here unstoppable. You're going to be able to do anything you want. It's like, that's what you're here for. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're taught that, well, you know, the world's a pretty oppressive place, and you're probably the bottom of the victim pile, and, 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 there's, and there's, oh, there's virtually nothing you can do about it except, you know, deconstruct the patriarchy. And it's so weak deed and so pathetic that, that, that universities should be embarrassed that that's what they're peddling to students. I'm embarrassed by it. You know, I've, I've gone on public record telling parents, bloody well send your boys to trade school, because at least they'll learn something useful. And that's a terrible thing for someone like me to say, because I do believe that, the art, that being articulated and educated in the highest possible manner is there's nothing that's better for you and for society. Mm -hmm. And why, are the, why have the universities forgotten this? Well, that's postmodern neo-Marxism for you, you know. <laughs> that, then the philosophy of intense resentment and oppression mm -hmm. and group identity and God, it's just mm -hmm. pathetic. Mm -hmm. It's like 
you know, I, you go out there with a stick and a sign on it that says, I'm against poverty. It's like, yeah, no kidding, man. <laughs> really. Like, who's, who's for poverty? No one's for poverty. So it's, 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 it's an abdication of responsibility with the mask of social virtue. Mm -hmm. You want to solve a difficult problem is you figure out how to get along with your brother, the one you've been fighting with for mm -hmm. five years. Or see if you can staple your family back together. See if you can stop fighting with your girlfriend and have a relationship that lasts for more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there are things that you should be doing in the confines of your own life that are private and humble, that would, that would constitute genuine accomplishments. And those are the things that you should attend to. And no one's going to come along and say, hey, you know, good job, you're, you're changing the world. Because it's, it's private, but mm -hmm. it's real. And, and people don't do that. And so, no, I don't, I don't, trust, the activist, I, I don't trust the activist ethos at all. Hmm. I, think it, I think everything about it is, is superficial and, mm -hmm. and trendy and, and too easy. And, and it externalizes the blame. The evil is always elsewhere, which mm -hmm. is a dreadful mistake to make. Because the evil isn't elsewhere. That's, that's the thing that you understand when you're wise. Hmm. is the evil is not elsewhere. It's you, because you're not everything you could be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you should work on that before going and telling someone else that maybe they're not who they should be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, I, so I don't buy it. It's too easy. It's far mm -hmm. too easy. And it's too public. Mm -hmm. And it's too self-congratulatory. And then there's the murderous, like, Marxist element, which, you know, I'm always often inclined <laughs> to mention. 